there used to be more than a dozen tuning fork tests before, but nowadays we have got other methods, better methods to assess the hearing, but still very basic tests you must know as a protocol. At least two uh, tuning fork tests you must be knowing. One is Rini's test and the other one is Weber's test. In addition, if you can uh, memorize ABC, absolute bone conduction, that is okay, but we will go for Rini's test. Now, there are tuning forks, and these tuning forks, they have, you know, engraved one number over there. This is the frequency for this one, because when we will strike it, the frequency which is engraved on that, this, according to that frequency, the prongs of this tuning fork will vibrate, okay? So, you have before, you know, embarking upon tuning fork test, you have to look far, okay? So, you will choose the frequency which is written over 512. 512 hertz. Then question comes, here it is 128. Another one will be with 256, double then. 512 and then there will be 1024 as well. So if all tuning fork set is available, why to choose this 512? This is again a question, okay? Multiple choice question it is there. Why to choose? Can anybody tell me if a normal ear can hear which frequencies? 20, 20, 20. So that is a huge range. 20 to 20,000, normal ear, human ear can hear those frequencies. And uh, what is the frequency I am talking about? That is the normal conversational voice frequency. This is the frequency which is 500 to 2000. 500 to 2000 is normal human conversational voice. Whisper will be less than that, shouting will be more than that. But human ear can perceive the frequency from 20 to 20,000. Normal conversation, have to choose this 512 because a person will come to you with complaint of hearing loss usually when he would not hear the conversational voice. Isn't it? When he is sitting with the company and he could not hear, then he will come. So that's why we have to choose this 512 which is just above the lowest range of normal human conversational voice. Okay? Then, during all these tuning fork tests, you have to hold it from its stem. Never hold it like this, or even these prongs should not touch your finger like this or anywhere to the patient because immediately when this will be touched, the vibrations will finish off. Second thing is that you have to hold it from here and where to strike, strike it against some firm surface. That firm surface is usually this olecranon process, but it should not be on the table like this because when I have to strike it, it will be there between two of us. The person sitting there should not be hearing the sound because that will be overstruck. That should not be there. Thirdly, the striking should be there at a point at the junction of upper one third with the lower two third because there if we strike it, the vibration will be maximum. For example, if I am striking it from here, this point, the vibration will not be optimal. Okay? Fourthly, when these prongs are in, you know, being struck and they are vibrating, what will happen? They will be vibrating in this direction, isn't it? And this is the external auditory canal long axis as well. So vibration is like this. So what happens? That sound is being compressed and then is relaxed and this is how the sound being carried away. So it should be this and this direction of this vibration should be along the long axis of the external auditory canal like this. It should not be had like this because when you will hold it like this, the direction will be like less sound will be, you know. Oh, what, whatever the interpretation of your test is, that comes at the end, especially for undergraduate, even if you could not perceive it properly still, it is manageable because before that, so many steps which will be observed by your examiner as an observer. If you have not struck it properly, you have not hold it properly, you have not you know, placed it in the long axis, so many points are there before you know starting even the test. So then Rini's test is basically comparison of air conduction and bone conduction. Again, you will go for air conduction and you will ask the patient when he stops hearing, he should tell, then you go for bone conduction. Of course, bone, if it is normal, then what positive bone conduction will not be there. Then you have to do it in a reverse order. That first bone conduction you will check and then air conduction. So that will take so much time, isn't it? So just to save the time, 
our improvisation on that is very simply that you will go far, you will strike it from here. Yes, sir. So this is very simple, quick. Time is saved that you just struck it, put it in the long axis, ask the patient if he can hear. He said yes, then go back on the bone conduction or the mastoid area, put it there and ask him now the sound is louder or less. In a normal ear or when Rini is positive or when the patient is having sensory neural hearing loss, air conduction will be better than bone conduction. And then you can do it in a reverse direction to confirm it. Okay, how are the reverse direction? Now this time first I will go for bone conduction. So I will go for so I will put it over the mastoid area. I will ask if he can hear or not. If he says yes, I can hear, then I can bring it here in the for air conduction and I ask him if he hears now louder or less. So positive will be when air conduction is better than bone conduction. Similarly, I will do it on the other side. So this will be the Rini. How you have to interpret or how you have to narrate it that Rini is positive bilaterally or Rini is negative on right side for example or whatever the situation is. So you have to describe it that Rini is positive or negative on both sides or on unilateral side. Then you come for the Weber's test. So Weber is that you have to compare the bone conduction of both sides. Okay, so for that you have to go for, you can brief the patient that I will put it over your forehead and you will hear it on both sides. You have to tell me on which side you can hear or if it is equal on both sides, then patient will say I am hearing it in the middle or I am hearing equal on both sides. So I will go for. <coughs> so. Weber is, in this particular person, the Weber is lateralized to this. Where he will hear better or he is hearing, we will say Weber is lateralized to that side. If it is equal, then Weber will be central. If, for example, the person could not respond well here, you can go on the vertex as well. But even if it is not responding, then very sensitive point is ask the patient to semi-open the mouth and then you can put it over the chin okay from the chin through temporomandibular joint and this and even you can remove this rubber uh, cover from here and you can put it over the upper incisors through upper incisors temporomandibular giant and th those are different points sensitive points accordingly sometimes the patient could not respond very well when patient is having you know severe or profound hearing loss so he will tell us so anyway these are the different points for Weber's test then uh, so Weber, as I told you, either it will be central or it will be lateralized towards either side. In sensory neural hearing loss, what will be the situation? In conductive type, what will be the situation? We will discuss when we will be discussing different types of hearing losses.